by the Simons Institute for the Theory of Computing. And my name is Peter Bartlett. I'm the Associate Director of the Simons Institute. Uh, we're a collaborative research institute in theoretical computer science, funded since 2012 by the Simons Foundation. And we run two programs each semester. Um, typically, they attract 60 to 70 long-term visitors each and include a boot camp and three workshops. And of course, those involve many more people. Uh, this semester, we're hosting two programs uh, entirely online so far, Probability, Geometry and Computation in High Dimensions, and uh, this one, The Theory of Reinforcement Learning. And together, they're involving around uh, 200 participants. So welcome to the first workshop of the RL program, Deep Reinforcement Learning. Uh, uh, a big thank you to our events coordinator, Ashley Hassan, for all her work on the logistics. Uh, to Omid Farr, our videographer, uh, and our IT expert, Drew Mason, for all the Zoom arrangements. Um, if you have questions uh, for the speakers, please use the Zoom Q&A feature. Um, also, a big thank you to the organizers, Lee Hong Lee and Mark Belpair, for uh, doing a fantastic job in putting together the program for this week's workshop. Uh, it looks quite exciting. Um, and I'll hand over to Lee Hong to say a few words about, about the workshop and its themes. Lee Hong. Have we lost Lee? Ah, oh, there we go, good. I'm here, yep, thanks, Peter. Um, can you see the screen? Yes. Yeah, yes. Okay, great. Yeah, so um, welcome everyone. Um, thanks for, uh, thanks, Peter. Um, welcome to the um, Deep Learning, uh, Deep Reinforcement Learning Workshop organized by Mark Valmel and myself. Uh, the workshop is part of uh, the fall program on theory of reinforcement learning, which will have two more workshops in the coming months. Uh, we would like to thank the Simons Institute for the great support that makes the workshop possible, especially during this unusual time when all events have become online. And moreover, we would like to thank you, the audience, for joining us in these virtual times and hope you enjoy the workshop. Um, It seems not work. okay. Yep. Um, so, what is the workshop about? Um, if you look at the current RL literature, you probably find two types of reinforcement learning. One of them looks at simpler models, such as tabular or linear representations, and develops pretty thorough theoretical understanding. The other, which is very popular in recent years, uses complex models, such as neural networks, to achieve many prominent empirical successes. However, the theoretical understanding of the latter is much more limited, and this is what the workshop is about. It focuses on theoretical problems inspired by deep RL in practice. It provides a forum to connect practitioners and theoreticians to share state-of-the-art in empirical studies and to motivate interesting open theoretical problems. Several topics will be covered, as we'll see shortly. Uh, this is a five-day workshop. We plan to spend each day on a particular theme, including, um, sorry, taking a little bit slowly. Okay, um, this is a five-day workshop. We plan to spend each day on a particular theme, including offline reinforcement learning, uh, exploration, optimization, representation, and uncertainty modeling. The technical sessions of each day runs from 9 a.m. to noon, Berkeley time, including invited talks and open-ended discussions. Each talk or discussion session will be 30, 30 minutes long. From noon to 1 p.m., we'll have an informal social on Get a Town for workshop participants. We hope you enjoy the, uh, find the workshop interesting and inspiring. Now I'm going to turn the presentation over to Mark so that he can start the first session of the workshop. Thanks. All right, fantastic. Thank you, Li Hong. Um, Li Hong, if you don't mind moving one slide forward. Um, all right, it's a, it's a real treat to have all of you here. Uh, this, is a, this is an exciting uh, time to be doing reinforcement learning, especially deep reinforcement learning. And um, I think the topic we'll see today on uh, offline reinforcement learning, as it's now called, is, uh, is indeed quite, quite a hot topic. So I'm excited to hear from all of our speakers. Um, Leon already covered the schedule. So without further ado, I think we'll just start uh, with uh, Tenyu Ma on model-based off offline policy optimization. So uh, please do continue. Cool. Um, 
let me share the slides again. You cannot. Um, Leon, you may not have to stop sharing your screen. Yeah, I cannot share screen while others are sharing. Okay, cool. Um, shall I just get started now? Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, thanks for uh, coming. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Tianhe, Kevin Yu, um, Gary Thomas, Lan Tao Yu, um, Stefano Erman, James Zhou, uh, Sergey Levin, and Chelsea Finn. I'm Tony Ma from Stanford University. I guess everyone else is also from Stanford University, except Sergey, who is from uh, Berkeley. So um, this is um, about model-based offline policy optimization. So um, I guess um, uh, let me start with the, the kind of the motivation of studying offline uh, RL, at least the my motivation of studying offline RL. So I guess uh, the bigger picture is that you know there is a simple efficiency challenge in applying RL to many of the real world applications. I guess we all know that RL is about trials and errors. So uh, the typical flow is that you say, I'm going to try the current strategy and collect feedbacks, and then I'm going to uh, use the feedbacks to improve the strategy. So this is a uh, um, child and errors, you know, it's very um, good. And we know that we know uh, how to solve this, uh, using this to solve Go, for example, uh, as long as we can try millions of games in a computer. However, uh, in reality, if you use this for um, uh, robotics or self-driving cars, then potentially you may have the problem that um, there are not in many you know, enough samples you can collect from the real environment just because of some physical uh, constraints of well, for some safety constraints. So I guess you know the question is how do we reduce the amount of trials or the amount of samples we need to implement RL in the real uh, applications? I guess one of the idea is model-based RL, which is considered to be a promising direction to reduce the sample uh, complexity. And another one is offline RL, which I'm going to find uh, in a moment. And also there are many other ways, for example, meta, uh, multitask, lifelong, continuous RL, uh, which are ways to amortize the cost, and maybe hierarchical RL, which you know, could also be a way to reduce the sample complexity. So I guess in this talk, I'm going to talk about offline RL, and the approach is model-based. So I guess you know, in, in a nutshell, offline RL is about that you don't have the trials and errors. You cannot collect feedbacks from the, uh, the real environment by trying your strategy. So formally, uh, uh, the definition of offline RL is as follows. So sometimes it's also called batch reinforcement learning. So we are given a batch of data, a batch of collection of um, trajectories sampled from some policy pi b. Sometimes we call this policy behavior policy, and sometimes it's actually collected from a mixture of uh, different policies. Uh, and this you know, collection of trajectories is sampled you know, from the real environment, the true dynamics T star. And we have this kind of, we start from some S0 and we are, execute this policy pi b and get the structures. And we also see some rewards, which is assumed to be known without loss of generality uh, in this talk, uh, just because you can always fold the reward in the dynamics. And our goal is to learn a policy that maximizes the expected return on the real environment. The expected return is just the sum of the return over time, and then we take expectation over the randomness of the initial states and also the randomness of the policy pi. So here, offline really means that we don't have any additional interactions with the real environment. So uh, after you see this trajectory of samples, then you cannot interact with the real environment. So um, it's, it's well known that there is this you know, so-called distributional distribution shift issue for offline reinforcement learning. Uh, this is roughly speaking that um, anything you learn from the batch, you, know, you can learn the, the, the model, you can learn the Q function, anything you learn from the batch only guarantees actual predictions, accurate predictions on the batch data distribution. The extrapolation to outside the batch data distribution uh, is not guaranteed. So, uh, and if you execute your policy, you'll learn some policy that have to go outside of batch data distribution, then there's a domain shift issue. For example, uh, uh, this, sometimes this you know, domain shift could be damaging. For example, if you learn your Q function on the batch, and then it may overestimate a Q function outside the support of the batch. Here is a simple experiment. So you have a, uh, we have a grid world uh, example. So you have an initial state at zero, the unique initial state, and also there's a unique goal. Uh, and you can go left, you know, up, up, upward, you know, leftward, you know, right, rightward, so on and so forth. And um, 
we have some batch data, which is only a single trajectory from the source, uh, from the initial uh, target to the, uh, sorry, the, the initial state to the goal. And um, if you learn, um, and here the reward is minus one. So if not reaching a goal, so that means that uh, if you're at the goal, then your reward is um, zero. And otherwise your reward, the optimal value function is minus distance to the goal. So however, uh, here I'm, what I'm plotting here is the heat map of the learned value function. If you learn on the batch data, the value function um, using either kind of Bellman equation or some Monte Carlo approach, then what you see is that um, the, uh, the value function learned, right? the heat map here shows that the value function is pretty correct on the batch. Actually, you know, we have verified that it's very small error on the batch. However, the, um, the value function wrongly extrapolate outside the batch. You can see that the value function actually linearly extrapolates. So the largest value function is obtained on the top left corner, uh, which is clearly wrong because the largest value should be uh, at the goal. So the extrapolate, extrapolation outside B uh, is wrong. And this you know, is damaging because if you use this value function uh, to induce some policy, even assume that um, you have the true dynamics, if you use this value function, then you're going to just follow the arrows, then you're going to go to the top left corner instead of the goal. So a common idea to deal with this domain shift or distribution shift issue uh, is that uh, what I call as strong pessimism, pessimism or strong conservatism. I'm just inviting this word for contrasting with the slightly milder conservatism I'm going to talk about in this talk. So basically the idea is that you should stay inside the support of the batch data distribution. Um, in other words, you only want to visit those states that you are very certain about. So this is kind of the basic idea um, uh, in many of the prior works. Uh, here, so uh, BCQ, Bayer, Brack, these are model free approach, which tries to restrict the action to be close to the action that we have seen. And Vince and CQL, these are trying to penalize the, um, either the value function or the Q function outside the batch data distribution. So I guess the question that we are uh, asking here, uh, uh, one of the motivating points for us to design the algorithm is that we're asking whether we can risk leaving the support of the batch data in exchange for higher return. Maybe in sometimes you know you want to really leave the support of the batch data because there's a better approach to uh, achieve the uh, solve the problem, achieve the goal. So uh, however, we are less certain about leaving the support. We have to take the risk, and how can we balance the risk in exchange uh, for higher possible return? So um, I'm going to you know demonstrate the main idea of the talk, you know, which is actually very simple on a simple toy case, the offline multi M bandit problem. So this is a dramatic simplification, but actually it turns out that it's, it's almost the same as the offline reinforced learning, at least from the talk, from the perspective of this talk. So this is basically multi arm bandit, but you can only pull your arm uh, once. This is kind of like you are thinking you are, uh, you are doing the last uh, bet in the casino and you have to really go home after this. Um, so uh, you cannot collect, you, know, uh, you cannot do any trials and errors anymore. Uh, I'm not going to use the casino as an example, I'm going to use Yelp. So, you are going, there are four restaurants, let's say, um, uh, you have you know, uh, some you know, batch data, uh, some past reviews for these four restaurants. Let's assume that the reviews are independent. Uh, and now you have to choose one restaurant to go. Uh, you want to maximize the, uh, you know, make your, uh, uh, maximize the, the taste, maximize the stars of the restaurant. So, um, so here, you know, I have, you know, I'm having this kind of like dramatic situation where for some restaurant you only have one reviews and for some other restaurants you have 10K reviews and they have different mean uh, uh, stars. So if you apply the strong conservatism kind of like approach to this multi uh, unbanded problem in the offline setting. So that means that you should consider to stay in the support of the batch data distribution. Of course, the support is a well, you know, it's not a well-defined notion in some sense because it's not robust to any small perturbation. So I'm interpreting the support here as that you, you need to have you know, enough density uh, um, in the batch data. This is also what the, uh, practically speaking, the, the, the prior work is trying to uh, use. So you need to stay in the support, in the uh, approximate support where the density is sufficiently large. So let's say, suppose you have to only consider those you know, restaurants with probability at least 2% in the batch data. And then uh, I'm designing this so that you know, if you make the 2% cutoff, you have to only choose restaurant four because that's the only restaurant with more than 2% uh, of the reviews in the batch data. And that means you can only choose 
restaurant four. Only for restaurant four, you have sufficient uh, data uh, for uh, to be certain. However, what we are going to do is that we are going to be a little bit milder. Uh, we are going to be uh, a little bit less conservative by considering uh, treating off the risk with the return. So, um, so what we do, so we have to characterize the risk, right? So we say, I'm going to compute a confidence interval uh, for each of the restaurants. Uh, here, I'm getting these numbers by assuming the error bar is proportional to one over squared n. Actually, I'm assuming the error bar is exactly plus minus one over squared n, just for the sake of simplicity. And then you get this upper uh, confidence bound and lower confidence bound for each of the restaurants. And then what we do is that we maximize the lower confidence um, um, bound of, of this five, uh, five restaurant. So you take the action uh, which maximize the lower confidence interval. So uh, confidence bound. And then we get to restaurant two, which in some sense guarantees the, um, uh, you know, some trade off between the risk and the return, right? So um, this is basically the main idea of this, uh, of this paper. So, um, so here is some super trivial from Matihan Bandit. And the only thing we have to do is to extend this to um, um, reinforcement learning. So back to offline reinforcement learning. So basically the main idea is the same. So the first step is that we build a, a certain quantification of the return. So we say, we want to make sure eta star pi, this is the true return on the true dynamics uh, to be in some interval, uh, eta height pi plus minus e, e of pi. And then after you get this uncertain quantification, you say, I'm going to maximize the lower confidence bound, uh, eta height pi minus e of pi. And then, um, then that's, that's the two steps. So basically this is uh, uh, what this talk is about. Uh, and I'm going to describe, uh, describe a little bit how do we do step one. And step two is pretty simple. Basically you just apply some optimization algorithm optimizing over the policy. So how do we build a certain quantification for the return? Uh, we are taking a model-based approach, meaning that um, we are starting from the uncertain quantification for the learned dynamics. And then we, trans we translate that uncertain quantification for the dynamics to uncertain quantification for the return. So we don't know how to do the answer quantification for the learned dynamics in a principled way. This is a very difficult way, difficult question. So any answer quantification with nonlinear model is difficult, but we assume we have a, a building block or a module or, or kind of Oracle to have answer quantification for the learned dynamics. And then we turn that uh, into answer quantification for the return uh, of the policy. So how do we do that? We learn a dynamical model T hat on the batch data uh, which is assumed to be deterministic for the moment. I'm going to extend it to stochastic case as well. So, and we also assume that the learning, so because learning identical model is supervised, so we assume that the supervised learning algorithm also come with a calibrated uh, guarantee, calibration guarantee. So assume that there exists an error estimator, we can obtain an error estimator U for the uh, dynamics T hat, satisfying that the error estimator U is admissible in the sense that it's indeed an upper bound for the real error. So T hat minus T star, the norm of T hat minus T star. So um, this is our assumption on the calibration of the model. And then we also assume that the value function V pi T star is sealiptious. Uh, I'm gonna expand on this a little bit um, uh, in the next slide, but basically you have to assume something about your value function or because you, know, you have to assume something about the reward function. Right? If the reward can be plus minus infinity, then there's no uh, uh, chance that you can uh, do anything offline because the reward at some other you know, state you, have to see, you haven't seen could be just a uh, um, uh, plus in infinity or negative to infinity. And then with these assumptions, we can prove that you have some uncertain quantification. So um, this is a um, uh, 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 confidence bound for eta star. So eta star is in eta hat pi plus minus e of pi. And the e of pi is equals to this quantity. It's a scalar c gamma, c gamma over one minus gamma times uh, the expectation of USA, the expectation of the error estimator uh, over uh, the, the trajectories sampled from the policy pi and the learned dynamics t hat. So, so this error estimator, uh, so the, this uh, e pi is something we can compute ourselves if we have the error estimator u and also the policy pi and t hat. So I guess I see a question. Is the, the right thing to do to answer the question right now? Uh, Go ahead and answer it, that's fine. Sure, okay.
Yeah, so uh, the question is, is it maximizing the lower bound, uh, confidence bound kind of exploration versus exploitation uh, dilemma Why being conservative with the lower bound only? So I guess uh, here, um, of, you know, this is a very good question. So why we are optimizing uh, the lower confidence bound? So uh, it sounds like this is still very conservative. I agree, this is still very conservative. We are just trading off uh, with the return a little bit. Uh, uh, and um, part of the reason we do this is that this is something um, this guarantees that we can have a lower bound for the real return, um, um, but potentially there could be better ways to do it. Um, I, I will discuss this probably more uh, at the end uh, in the open questions. Can you, while we, where we'll stop, I'll just say you have about five minutes left on the talk itself, and then we can discuss some of these final points also. Sure, sounds good. So, um, Okay, so this is basically the, uh, the how do we do the uncertainty quantification. So um, we use the uncertainty quantification for the dynamics and turn it into uncertainty quantification for the return. Uh, and you can also have a unified approach for stochastic dynamics. You know, um, so here what we do is that this 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 page is a little bit abstract, but bear with me for the moment. So we assume that the value function belongs to some c times a scalar times a family of uh, functions, capital F, uh, and we assume some error estimator uh, in a a slightly different form. So you assume that because this is um, uh, um, um, now stochastic dynamics, then t of s a and t star of s a are uh, uh, random variables or distributions. So then we measure the quality of the dynamics by estimate um, by measuring the uh, the distance between t s a and t star of s a. And here the distance is the integral probability metric i p n between the two distributions with respect to f. And we want that the error estimate to be the upper bound of that. Um, so just to, to remind you that the IPM is a way to measure the distance between two distributions via the test function f um, belonging, belonging to the family capital F, right? So you look at the expectation of f under the two distributions, you take the differences, and then you take the soup over all the test functions. And um, this allows us to unify a, a few different cases. For example, if you assume v pi t star is Lipschitz, then the distance is the Wasserstein distance. And when the dynamic is deterministic, then the distance is just L2 distance. And if V pi T star is bounded, then the distance is TV distance. And if V pi T star is some kind of kernel space, then uh, DF could be the maximum mean discrepancy distance. So uh, with this, we can prove us um, almost the same you know, result, um, um, but just uh, under a more general assumption. So it's the same, basically the same uh, guarantee. So we know that E of pi of the same form uh, is uh, error estimator for the true return. Uh, I guess um, I'm going to skip the proof sketch, you know, uh, I'm just going to flash it, you know, because I have limited time. So the proof sketch is very simple. Actually, this is, you know, uh, has been done, you know, in many uh, prior work as well. So basically you're just trying to build the upper bound for eta star pi minus eta height pi. Eta height pi is the return on the virtual environment and eta star pi is the return on the real environment. The first step is to do some kind of like test scoping sum which I'm not explaining in detail. And then um, the test going sub with instant expectation is basically a way to measure the differences between t hat and t star under the test function of v pi. And then you use the IPM definition and you change that to IPM. And then you know that IPM is less than the U of SA um, and that's it. So, um, and then with this, you know, uh, so the quantification, we can do a second step. Uh, and this is the model voice based policy optimization with the reward penalty. Recall that in the second set, we are trying to optimize pi. Uh, 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 we are trying to optimize over pi, the lower bound, e to high pi minus e of pi. And it turns out that because the form of the e of pi, the lower bound can be written as this expectation of r of sa minus lambda of e of sa, be just because what's you know under the expectation are the same. So you can merge them together into a single expectation. And then you realize that this is basically optimizing uh, 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 the policy uh, for penalized MVP and tilde, which is defined to be having the same learned dynamics t hat and then the penalized reward r tilde, which is penalized by lambda times the answer amplification of the dynamics. And then you just use some off the shelf R algorithm to optimize it. So, and how do we implement the answer amplification for the dynamics uh, in practice? Uh, I, I've, I've thought about this kind of like answer amplification for a while in the last few years. Uh, it turns out that, you know, uh, there are not so many, you know, very good uh, uh, ways to do isolation amplification, especially under out-of-domain uh, shift. 
for even supervised learning. So what we do is just a heuristic. We just use the ensemble uh, to uh, to do the heuristic for U of I C. So you take you know an ensemble of models and then you look at the differences between the output of these models. So um, I guess I'm running a little bit late, so I'm going to also skip this. You know, uh, slides. You know, I kind of. Uh, I started, you know, the motivated talk by talking about the trade-off between the gains and the, and the risk of leaving batch data support. We can also characterize that a little bit. Um, this is just a super uh, simple extension of the of the theorem. So basically, you can characterize what uh, the property of the policy you have is kind of like a, doing some kind of like trade-off between uh, taking uh, the risk, you know, or uh, maximizing the uh, the uh, it is take um it's, Trading off between the uh, having small small risk and maximizing uh, the return. So here the um, the policy is you know larger than eta star pi minus two lambda times epsilon of pi. Epsilon of pi is a way to measure uh, the risk, and basically you are trading off these two terms. I'm going to just uh, skip some of this. Um, so um, we did uh, a bunch of you know evaluation. Um, uh, you know at the so this paper is, you know, even though there's some theory here, mostly it's about, you know, empirical results. So we did an evaluation on the default RL data set, which is uh, recently collected, you know, um, benchmark data set for offline reinforcement learning. And then we see that our results um, uh, are better than some of the prior best methods uh, on uh, a bunch of fixed environments. So here, the kind of environments we're doing pretty well are those kind of so-called mixed or random environment, meaning that uh, here, the best data are from a mix of policy or from random policy. So, um, it, so we suspect that the reason is that uh, we are doing well when the best data uh, are somehow kind of like diverse. So this it allows us to have a good answer interpretation for the dynamics. The dynamics can extrapolate outside the support of the data. However, if the batch data is not diverse enough, like in the medium, which means that you only have a single policy uh, in the batch that generates the batch data, uh, then um, the batch data is very kind of like a low dimensional and the extrapolation of the dynamics is not good. So that's why our method is not as competitive as in other cases. So we also evaluate um, this uh, uh, on the so-called so out-of-distribution offline RL tasks that we designed. So this is to test whether uh, our method is doing well in those situations where the agent has to take the risk of leaving the support of the batch data to achieve higher reward. So, so we try to design a task like this so the batch data and the uh, and the, the task itself are somewhat different. So for example, one of the tasks is called an angle. So where the batch data in the batch data at the ends only runs forward on, on the right hand side to the right hand side. However, in the task, you are supposed to let the end to go in a direction with degree 30. So if you want to solve the task very well, then you have to leave the batch data support uh, to do um, uh, uh, leave the batch data support to some degree. And the cheetah jump is the same thing. So basically, uh, in the batch data, the, the cheetah is running forward, but the, the task requires the cheetah to supposed to uh, to jump uh, a little bit. So you have to leave the batch data um, distribution. So and we can see that our you know uh, advantage over prior work uh, is in some sense kind of like a, uh, um, uh, amplified, partly because the prior work are trying to uh, stay in the um, batch data distribution. Okay, so um, um, just uh, the summary. So uh, this talk is about offline model-based RL. Uh, and the approach is that we have a reward penalty from the uncertain quantification of the dynamics. And we just optimize the penalized uh, virtual uh, environment. So um, some open questions. So one of the obvious open questions is that how do we do tighter uncertain quantification? Um, so we have a way to do uncertain quantification, which is obviously not very tight for many cases. Uh, and how do we have tighter answer quantification? And another uh, question is related to some of the questions uh, asked in the talk. So uh, how can we be less conservative than optimizing the lower confidence bound? So optimizing the lower confidence bound allows us to show that you know, the, the thing we are optimizing is a lower bound for the real return, and that gives us some property. However, potentially, you know, I don't know, I'm kind of torn by this, um, but potentially there is a way to be less conservative uh, uh, than, than doing this. Uh, and I, I'd like to spend just the one minute to have uh, some advertisements for some of my other IR work um, uh, in deep reinforcement learning, which I spend a lot of time uh, these days, you know, thinking about some of these questions. So one of the work is uh, we are studying 
uh, the differences between model base R and model free R through the lens of expressivity. So we show that in, many ca in uh, certain cases, the Q function can be much more complex to express than the model uh, itself, which suggests that um, which kind of like indicates model base is probably uh, have some you know, advantage over model free in these kind of cases. And also we are trying to address the distribution of distribution shift in matter reinforced learning by using model based ideas as well. So I guess this is all I want to say. I'm running a little bit late. Um, thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Tenya. So um, I'm going to, I have a few questions, but I'll actually leave the uh, audience to ask first. Uh, I believe that, Gerger, you had uh, a question about the simulation lemma. So I'll let you ask it directly, in fact. Um, and as a reminder, we also have at uh, 1130 Pacific time, a larger discussion of, of RL. So maybe we can focus on technical details for the talks and come back to the broader discussion at 1130. Uh, Gerger, you want to go first? Uh, yeah, sure. Thank you, Mark. And thanks to you for the talk. So I was just wondering about this result that relates the model estimation error to, yeah. the, to the policy value error. So is this not the simulation lemma? This is just a simulation it... lemma. Oh, I'm, I'm not sure whether that's a common word, but you know, but this is just a simulation lemma. We do a little bit uh, uh, in, on top of it by doing the Wasserstein IPM thing, but you know, but it's just a simulation lemma, yes. Yeah. Right, but when you, for example, when you try to come up with confidence intervals in terms of Wasserstein distance, can you actually like do this for any reasonable class of models? or you're just using it as an abstract example? Um, so if you, uh, I'm just using that as an example, but um, sorry, can you say the last question? Again? Yeah, so like, can you, can you like derive meaningful bounds on the Wassenstein distance uh, that would lead to like a reasonable algorithm? Um, you know, so um, the Wassenstein distance come, so, so, we so after we got the Wasserstein distance, we assume that you have an error estimator for the Wasserstein distance. And then there's nothing, so like everything is folded in the assumption in some sense. So basically- I see, I see. So there's a bit uh, of a wishful yeah. thinking in there. Yeah, 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 that's right, that's right. Yeah, so right. Uh, and I guess TV distance is even left, it's even more wishful thinking, right? So right. Uh, I don't think in reality, you can get a model that can be accurate in TV distance. That sounds like very hard to achieve. Yes. So, uh, so, so yeah, so that's just uh, for demonstration. Yeah, uh, this lemma is basically just a simulation lemma, that's it. All right, gotcha. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, okay, are there other questions for Tenyu? Well, um, this is not uh, really a question, uh, but I, I saw that the, one of the open problems is tighter uncertainty quantification. I just wanted to point it out that uh, this is um, the some of the talks on Friday will talk about uncertainty quantification. So if people are interested, so that would be uh, something uh, interesting to look at. Thanks. Looking forward to the talk. So I, I, I have a in terms of, question. Oh, um, right, go ahead. So, so it seems like. Uncertainty quantification, you know, is certainly an important part of, of what you're doing. Uh, and I was just wondering what your experience was with using ensembles, um, because it seems like, you know, what ensembles are really measuring is sort of the variance in your optimizer, you know, so you can imagine the worst case, you just have an optimizer that completely ignores the data, outputs exactly the same thing every time, and you say, you know, great, zero epistemic uncertainty. So uh, how much did you run into that in, in practice? So um, I think we look at the, uh, the error, the correlation between the ensemble uh, error estimator with the real uh, 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 error. Uh, surprisingly, the, the correlation is pretty well. So I think the harder part is that what if you optimize your policy based on that error estimate, right? So if you just take some random policy or take some kind of like fixed policy and you look at this as some quantification by the uh, ensembles, uh, I think my, uh, my experience says that it seems that it's generally pretty okay. But however, the tricky part is that if you uh, do some optimization, uh, then you may overfit to the ensemble you have. So, so here we are pretty pessimistic. We are taking the uh, one step error uh, using ensemble, and then we take the sum of the errors, right? So that's what the telescoping or the simulation lemma is doing, right? So, um, so that seems to uh, reduce this issue a little bit. So it's very hard to kind of overfit code code overfit to the ensemble because you are taking uh, the error for every step and then you take the sum. 
Um, I'm not sure whether I answered the question. So, but generally, I, I don't really know. Like uh, for, for us, it seems to be okay. And also we have a uh, slightly different ways to do the answer complication in the paper. We have two ways. One way is that we can learn a stochastic model actually. And you take the maximum of the variance uh, across the five uh, stochastic uh, models like uh, you learned. And another way is you to look at differences between the disagreements between the ensembles. And both of them works uh, pretty, pretty fun. One method works a little bit better than the other. So, um, but yeah, but, but generally I don't have much more <laughs> to say than this, like uh, it, it's, it's pretty empirical. We just try, try, try these things. Yeah, uh, yeah thanks. I, I wanna uh, ask a slightly leading question, but uh, uh, maybe this, uh, this will be interesting to discuss. So, Sergey, before you start, I'll just say one last question from you and then we'll switch to Emma. Thank you. Um, so uh, you said that you need to do uncertainty quantification, uh, but I wonder if maybe the problem is actually a little bit easier than that. Uh, because all, all, all that's really needed by the algorithm is some notion that this is like a bad place to be. And I wonder if that's actually easier than uncertainty quantification for, as an example. So there's, there's a question in the Q and A about upper bounds versus lower bounds and exploration and exploitation that got me thinking about this. If you do count based exploration, uh, that is kind, kind of estimating uncertainty in a state, but estimating a count is easier than estimating epistemic uncertainty on a model. Mm -hmm. So uh, I wonder if, what your opinion is on whether there's basically an, an easier way that doesn't require the full posterior. I see. So, yeah, I guess uh, I yeah, I guess I don't quite know. So so this is you know this is very um, this is kind of like what I'm asking. I guess you know I'm not sure exactly I'm interpreting the question in the right way, but this is kind of like what I, I was thinking about less being less conservative. Uh, but on the other hand. I guess at least uh, thinking from a theoretical perspective, you know, if you're less conservative, then sometimes all bets are off, like you don't have any guarantees. So, so finding the right, you know, uh, middle middle ground seems to be the <laughs> the hardest part. Uh, and and also, I guess another maybe not answering exactly your question. So, but one question is how do we extrapolate to the unseen states, right? So, if you want to do well, do you have to extrapolate as much as possible to an unseen states? and which mechanism you are trying to, uh, you are relying on. So are you relying on the model to extrapolate or you are relying on the Q function to extrapolate or you are relying on something more kind of like uh, advanced to extrapolate. That's something uh, I assume is also an interesting open question. All right. Um, Tony, thank you so much for this talk. Um, it's exciting to see so much interest in the topic and uh, so many questions to start. Uh, so let's